Hello, class. This is uh, welcome to ECN 1000 Economics Associate Issues, and my name is uh, Lydia Gunn. I'll be teaching this course. And the first class that we have today, um, it's going to be on Chapter 1. And so, again, what I ask you to do is please uh, download your PowerPoint slides and print them out and have them in front of you uh, so you can kind of like follow the, my lectures along. So, um, in chapter one, so again, you are, this is probably the first time you're taking um, any economic classes before. So we want to do a few definitions. Again, so this is chapter one that we're doing. And get a better pen. So I want to ask you a question. Number one, what exactly is economics? What's your understanding of economics? So a lot of time when I ask my students that, some of them will say, oh yeah, it's about money. Uh, it's about the financial market, uh, but what exactly is economics? What is the correct or precise definition of what an economics is? And in order to understand that, I would have to introduce a few other terms here. So for example, the word scarcity. Okay, so uh, to some extent that means uh, limited. Okay, so in economics, right, we are dealing with limited or scarce resources. But then usually the human being, you know, we have uh, uh, unlimited ones, but then the resources are out there are somewhat limited. So what's considered as resources? So when you think of the word resources, you think about, oh, for example, natural, natural resources. And what would that be? That would be like your oil, your natural gas, for example. Uh, you might say in the US you produce uh, iron, and so on and so forth. Okay, so. And then there are other types of resources as well. For example, we say human resources. So most of you have heard of that, about the, the term human resources. So that's referring to labor, the labor that you hire. So an example would be labor. Okay, what else? You may have heard about capital resources. Okay, so capital resources basically means uh, like money. You know, like your assets, like your liabilities, your investment in the stock market, uh, in your investment in bonds, your investment in saving, checking account, retirement account, and all that you have. So, so you know, we say that naturally in the world like today, we are dealing with uh, limited resources because we don't have everything in the world. So even time, and that's the other thing that is considered a resource. For example, we say, well, I've got 24 hours and people like Bill Gates has 24 hours, Donald Trump has 24 hours, so, so do you. So we all have 24 hours, which is limited hours, really, and, but we have unlimited ones. You know, we do, you want to do so many things, like for example, you know, you want, if you have a million dollars, what would you do with it? Yeah. Uh, but the, the fact is we don't have, you know, a million dollars. And if you have 48 hours a day, what would you do with it? So in other words, uh, human needs are uh, unlim uh, unlimited, but then resources out there are limited. Okay, so economics is a study of the allocation of resources. How you divide up your resources, allocation, of resources, and actually I will re redefine it a little bit. I would say uh, allocation of limited or scarce resources to satisfy unlimited human Instead of using the word needs, I'm going to use the word wants. So we want everything in the world. We want all the money in the world. We want all the time in the world. And we want uh, to avail ourselves to work as much as we can. So 
So the key term here is allocation of resources and what kind of resources is limited resources. So as the example showed you, to satisfy the unlimited human want. So that's a study of economics. And most of you are familiar probably with the term uh, microeconomics and macroeconomics. So we'll get into that. Um, so because of this uh, scarcity, so you have to make choices. So in economics, when you make choices, we call that uh, trade off. Or another term for it is opportunity cost. So the term opportunity cost is a big word in economics. For example, if I were to ask you, you know, what is your opportunity cost of uh, sitting across from me now um, listening to my video? So you might say, yeah, I could have used that half an hour, you know, uh, to sleep. I could have used that half an hour to eat. Or I could have used uh, that half an hour to go out and work, you know, or go work out in the gym, you know. Something that you have to forego to do what you're doing now at present, it's called opportunity cost. And so the definition in the book says that the foregone alternative of the choice made. Now, some of you might say, well, I could do so many things. I could think of so many things. But remember that it's the next best activity that you forego. So it's not like a combination of all, you know. Yeah, I could have gone, I could have, uh, gone to movie and watch a uh, movie theater and watch a movie. I could have gone to try hamburger in McDonald's. I could have slept, you know, half an hour doing all this stuff. So it's not, like, it's not the combination of all these activities but it's the next best alternative. Okay, so then you have to decide there's only one activity because you can't do really multitasking in this world, assuming that you can't uh, for the sake of this discussion that we have here. So because of that, and, and that's your opportunity cost. So because we live in a world that we don't have everything, so we have to, uh, we all experience something called trade-off. So if you want to have more of good X, you would have less of the other good. So the next thing that we want to talk about is in economics, we use more than a few. I do not know, uh, most of you may, you know, like uh, uh, major in social work or sociology or biology or any, any of these non-business courses. But, you know, when we talk about modern in economics, we're referring to two things uh, specifically. Like, what are some of the tools that you use to study economics? Number one is a graph. In economics, we use graphs a lot to do our analysis. Okay, so we'll be uh, talking about that quite a bit. And then next, uh, we use uh, math a little bit, and specifically algebra. So, uh, basically, model is like we look at a small, uh, you know, tools to, to analyze something to try to explain the big pictures of the economy out there. So, a lot of things that you would study in this course would be like concepts in microeconomics and macroeconomics, and then we'll try to tie it in with some of the uh, social issues, uh, you know, in today's world, like for example, healthcare. Uh, Obama healthcare and ex other example would be like prescription drugs. You know what kind of market it is. Is this a monopoly or is this a perfect competition, and, and so on and so forth. And, and what about the market? Is the market very concentrated? What does it mean by market being very concentrated? And what about like college education? Is it getting so expensive that nobody could afford? So these are some of the issues that we'll be looking at. And then in the macroeconomic sense, later part of the semester we'll be talking about like uh, the European uh, debt crisis. So this is some of the application that you could use in macroeconomics. Um, okay, next what I want to talk about is uh, the, I think most of you know the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. So let me just give a little bit of introduction. So I believe the first five chapters of the book you deal with the microeconomics part, okay? And then the next uh, 
So this would be for, um, I'm going to write it down for you, chapter 1, 2, 5. And so what exactly is microeconomics? In the case of uh, microeconomics, you study, this is a studying of decision-making by three groups of people, and basically by the household, or consumers, and by firms, or producers, and the government. People like Obama, for example. Okay? So in other words, you look at the specific uh, industry. Okay, you look at how household will make, or individual or consumer will make choices based on the information given, like for example, prices. If the price of hamburgers goes up, you know, would you buy more units or buy less units? So what about firms? You know, their goal is to maximize their profits. So how do they do that? How do they do that under various market structures, for example? What about the government? How does the government make decisions in the world like today? You know, like uh, they do have welfare program, for example. They have unemployment uh, compensations for people who are unemployed and you have to be eligible because you have to be actively looking for a job in the last four weeks. So that's the clear definition of what is unemployed, uh, for being unemployed. Um, what are some other examples? Medicare and Medicaid, for example. Uh, these are some of the things that the government give out, right? The people who are over 65 years old, you qualify for uh, Medicare, and also you can withdraw your Social Security payment uh, checks, that is. Um, and Medicaid is basically for people who are below certain poverty level uh, in order to be eligible for government welfare. And in order to be eligible, really, all this thing we call it transfer payment. Uh, well, I don't know how I get into it, but basically transfer payment is something that, you know, receive the subsidies from the gov government without them expecting that you return anything, any services back to them. For example, you know, if the, you qualify for unemployment and compensation, when you get your monthly unemployment uh, checks, you know, uh, they don't ask you to come in weekend and to f perform like 10 hours of community service. No such thing. Because what essentially it is, is uh, they're going to give it to you because you're eligible, because you qualify for it, without them expecting any services in return from your part. Okay, so that's basically it's uh, microeconomics. You talked about market structures. Uh, just to give you a preview of what we'll be talking about in the next few chapters, uh, we'll be talking about, for example, price elasticity. What is it? Uh, profit maximization by firms and things like that. Um, and what is consumer surplus? What is producer surplus? What is debt with loss, for example? I know all these are economic terms, you know, it sounds like mumbo jumbo to you, but when you get to the later on, all these chapters, you would, you know, you'd be able to read and find out a little bit more. Okay, next thing is macroeconomics. So a while ago, uh, I was asking the question right earlier, like, you know, if I would mention the word economics, what comes to mind? You know, a lot of people would say, oh yeah, I think in terms of money. So nobody think in terms of how do I spend my time, how do I allocate my time efficiently in such a way that it is efficient so I will benefit from it. Usually people don't think so much about it, think in terms of money, you know. That's a little bit more direct. Okay, macroeconomics is you study the uh, you actually study the big picture of the economy. You study the uh, performance of economy, of an economy. So some of the things that you study, for example, would be like, you would look at things like GDP, what is the gross domestic products of U.S. versus um, China or India, for example, and how do you measure that? What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of using gross domestic products? Okay, and the other thing that you would study is inflation. 
Okay, every time you drive to gas pump, you put in gas, you know, do you care about gas prices? I think we all do, because if the gas prices go up substantially from what it is now, like uh, $2, a little bit more than $2 to $4 per gallon, some of you might switch to riding motorcycle or riding public transportation. You might start taking more online classes instead of taking face-to-face -face class, you know, or consolidate your trip, your grocery trip and shop once a week or once in two weeks instead of I like, do it every other day. Okay, so that's your inflation. And the other thing is unemployment. And then we also talk about economic growth. So this is some of the things we talk about. And of course, we would also study aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Okay. Uh, and you also would talk about money, uh, government policy. So the big picture, so for example, we economy was in a uh, great recession between 2007 to 2009. And then also experienced deflation around 2009 to 2010. So what, uh, what did the government have to do to get us out of recession? So that's your fiscal and monetary policy there. Okay, so that's toward the end of the semester. Last two chapters we'll be talking about that. So basically that gives you a pretty good idea of what exactly is microeconomic part of this course and what exactly is a macroeconomics part of this course. Okay, so next uh, I want to introduce, uh, since we're still in chapter one, so we're dealing mostly with the microeconomic part. I just erase that, but you know, if you want to go back, you can pause the video so you can go back and look at what uh, was written. I think you should be able to see this bonds uh, quite clearly. So the next thing that I want to uh, introduce is a graph. Okay. Um, in economics, uh, I'm just going to introduce what is the basic graph first. So some of you may remember your high school math. For example, you have this uh, graph that, you know, this is what the graph shapes like. You have an L, basically up here, you, we call this a y-axis or vertical axis, and this is your so-called x-axis, okay? So basically what this is, is uh, you're reading from origin, point of origin, you're reading up this way, you're reading from left to right. So in economics, usually in the product market, for example, this would be price. Okay, for example, here will be your quantity. Well, let's take a look uh, at hamburgers. This is the number of hamburgers. For example, you might say, oh, if the price of hamburgers is a uh, dollar, I will buy 10 units. So you have point A here. Okay, so this is how you plot your graph. If the price of hamburgers is a uh, dollar, which is very cheap, then you will buy 10 units. And if it's a size, so let's jump up to say three dollar, and you will buy less of it, actually, because you know it's more expensive. So you might buy seven in this case. You go up here, up here, so this point right in here, this is a point B. And if the price is five dollars, which is considered rather expensive, and you might just buy maybe about four. So this is just an example, okay, they're not quite proportionate. So point A, B, and C, we join this point together, and that basically is a graph, you know. Okay, now, the other graph that I would like to introduce that would demonstrate this idea of what we call trade-off and opportunity cost, going back to what we talked about earlier, it's known as PPF. What does PPF stand for? Okay, so you might want to refer to your book or your PowerPoint slide. PP PPF stands for production possibility frontier. Which 
Home time, uh, PPC stands for production possibly be curved. Okay, you could use it, uh, you could use that term uh, synonymously. So depending on which textbook you use. So let's look at the one that you have on your PowerPoint slide. So again, you have L and we want to have two goods. So the example you have here is soda on your Y axis and then on your X axis you have pizza. So we want to look at this, uh, demonstrate this concept known as trade-off using this production possibility function. So then you would say, given that you have limited resources, so your limited resources here will be like, for example, given that you have $100 to spend, how are you going to spend this $100? What, uh, how do I make my choices? And assuming in economics we make a lot of assumption. So assuming that you can only spend it on soda or pizza, or both, combination of both, then we say, let's say a point S, so I think we could give an example, uh, zero, let's say this is uh, 100 units of soda, uh, and this means that you're buying no pizza, okay? But this point here means you consume everything in soda. Let's say uh, 100 is a big number, let's just do 10 for now, okay? We'll do a small number, next time we'll do a bigger one. Okay, so how about here? Here we might say, now if you consume nothing but uh, pizza, and you might buy seven pizza. So make it a little bit bigger, how about 12? And then at that point, so this, this is just an example. So that will be your point S on your graph, and this will be your point P. And then you have something in between. So you have a production possibility curve that looks kind of like that. So it bows out, you know, it's like, uh, that's what it's shaped on. So what that means is that uh, now everything in between, everything that's on the point, what we call the PPF, is how you describe this uh, uh, curve here, production possibility fun frontier is. What is the combination of things that you could consume uh, if you were to give a $900, you could only consume between pizza and soda? So, and then we'll introduce a few other terms. For example, we say any point that's outside this PPC, you know, outside this frontier, outside, we call unattainable. And that's simply because you don't have the resources, you don't have enough money to get that far, you know, or you don't work enough to earn this. So in order to, earn, to be reach that point, you may have to work longer, work harder, uh, and things like that. And, and we say that all this point here that I'm drawing here, these are considered attainable. Attainable means it is possible within your limits, you know, to consume them. For example, you could see that as you move from this point to this point, uh, I'm trying to look at all these numbers, you use x, y, n, and then you have z and p. So now, if you were to move from s, x to y to m to z and p, all right, you know, let's erase this one. So basically what happened is as you consume more and more units of pizza, you have to give up more and more units of soda. That's what it means. So let's just take, for example, point N here. So this means that uh, this is 7 now, and this might be at, uh, say, 8 here. So in other words, you have to give up 3 units of soda in order to gain um, how many more units of pizza here. So in this case, uh, I think we have to have another one here. So in order to have to consume less units of that, um, you have to give up two units of, uh, three units of this, because 10 minus 7 is 3, in order to gain um, the, between 8 to 12, in order to gain the uh, four units more of the pizza. Okay, so that's basically what it is. And if you look at it, you could see two shapes of the PPF. Sometimes you see it in the form of a downward sloping, uh, like a, a straight line, excuse me. I have to pick up my eraser there. 
Okay, so let's erase. Now another PPF looks like this. So this is a straight line instead of like a curve, you know, bows out. So you have the same unit here, soda, and you have pizza here. Okay, so and then you have all these points, X, Y, and M, and Z, and then finally your P here. So again, this is your unattainable point. That means the one that you're not able to produce because it's beyond your resources. And here, your case is attainable, all these points. So any points that are on the front here is considered attainable. You're able to get them. Now, what if they are inside the front here? If you're inside, we say you experience some sort of unemployment because, uh, you know, not everybody who wants to get a job gets a job, you know. So what happened here is uh, you could uh, um, you could produce you could give up more units of soda in order to produ uh, to consume more units of pizza because they're trade off. Trade off means you have to give up something. If you don't spend something on good A, then you spend it on good B. That's what it means. If you're given just fixed income. And then if you're inside this point means it's not efficient because you're not quite using it up to the your capacity. So if you're inside the frontier, it's considered not efficient. And one example, this is not the only example, is unemployment. So what do you do? You know, uh, if you're unemployment, you consume less of everything. But if you work overtime, you might push yourself beyond that point to reach an unattainable attainable point here. So another difference, very obvious difference that you see between these two graphs is that, oh yeah, that one is a curve and this one is a straight line. So it turns out that this is a case when people are the same. When we say people are the same, they have, they have same kind of skills, so same kind of skills that is. So therefore the trade-off is uniform. You know, that's kind of like boring, you know, what society has something like that. Everybody has the same kind of skills. Over here is uh, when people have different kinds or variety of skills. So then uh, it's different, you know, how you would consume it. You, the, the way you make decisions would be pretty different. And, and so this is the one with uh, people with different skills. Okay, now we have a word for it. People with different skills here, we say this is, uh, when it bows out like that, we say that the PPF demonstrate this increasing opportunity cost. So what that means is that you have to give up more and more units as, well, as you give up the same amount of units, you have to do, in order to consume more of the other units, it, it gets more and more so as you consume more and more units. In other words, in a very specialized society, this is true. You know, for example, like if uh, Mexico is, if U.S. is doing a trade, trade with uh, Mexico and U.S. produce, uh, say, mm, uh, cowboy boots and cowboy hats, and Mexico will produce poncho and tortilla and that sort of thing, so if you were to trade with one another, uh, of course U.S. Has a, has a comparative advantage in producing cowboy boots and cowboy hats. So if that's the case, you know, U.S. is specialized in producing cowboy boots and cowboy hats, but not ponchos and tortilla and, and all this stuff. So if you specialize in it, then we say that it's increasing opportunity cost here. So, uh, so it's better that you specialize in the goods that you you're good at, you know, where you have all the resources. So that's basically what it means. Eh? And over this side here, we say people with same skill. Uh, 
or the skills are basically identical. Um, again, this is just a model, you know, in real world, I don't think that exists because everybody have different talents and skills here. This is when your PTC or your PTF demonstrates constant um, opportunity cost. So this is in theory, and I think in the today's world, we see more of this kind, that the opportunity cost is increasing. So as you produce more and more units, because people actually specialize in it. So in other words, you know, if you don't specialize, you keep producing things that you're not so good with. You're losing out in terms of your opportunity cost there. Okay. So next, I want to introduce a few basic terms in economics before we get to this uh, circular flow diagram. And that's in your book on page... Uh, Oh, page seven, yeah. That's actually a pretty uh, big picture there with a lot of stuff in it. So, um, let's see. So this is called circular flow model. So in this model, you can represent the all parts of the economy in terms of factor market, product market, money market, and so on. Okay, and that's in your figure 1.7, page 7. Okay, page 7, figure 1.7. Well, there's only one diagram there, so if, if you turn to page 7, you see it, you know. So what exactly is this circular flow diagram? This is a diagram that shows you all the agents that are involved in the economy and how many types of markets are out there, and, and how do they do transaction? Where does the money flow? Uh, or in this case, it might be saving. So in order to do that, we want to define a few terms. Number one, we want to define what is market. Market consists of both buyers and sellers. If you buy or sell, it's not considered a market because it's a market is a place where you do selling and buying. So both consumers and producers have to be involved, and that's the economic definition of what exactly is a market. Now, when you talk about factor market, and then, well, I'm just giving you a rundown of all the markets that we'll be talking about. Factor market is one of them, goods and services market. Uh, for example, the example I showed you earlier about price of hamburger. You know, if the price of hamburger goes up, you buy less of it. So that's your product and service market. Where your, uh, your vertical axis will have the price or the value of the good, and then your x-axis will be your quantity that you will buy. In, in that example I show you. And then you have foreign exchange market. So that's when you talk about trading with other partners outside the U.S., other countries like Mexico and Canada, for example. Uh, and then we didn't quite elaborate on what exactly is a factor market. That's where you could uh, buy and sell factor. Like uh, when we talk about factor, we really talk about input. Okay, your production factor like labor, uh, your capital, your financial assets, things like that. Okay, so a while ago I mentioned the actors in the economy. So when you study microeconomics, remember I mentioned that this is a decision making by three groups of people and basically the households, the firms, and the government. And these are the agents. So what happened is in the middle here, you have the government. Okay, I don't think I'll draw the diagram. I, I'm just kind of like explaining the, the interaction very quickly. Um, because I think it's rather self-explanatory so basically you have the government as the agent at the, in the middle, and then you have the household. I am using the short form, and then you have the firms on this side. Okay, so I think we could add a few things here very quickly. I'm gonna use my red marker. And then you have uh, three types of market up here. I'm going, going to use a square to represent a factor market. Okay, and down here I'm going to use a box to represent goods and services market. Oh, 
oh, this is your product market, the hamburger. The hamburger example I used earlier. Okay. So basically we said uh, these are the agents. Three round one, and then you have two markets that are in uh, block or square, see? And then I'm going to use a red marker to show you some of the activities that are going on. Uh, so, I mean, it's very straightforward because, uh, first of all, you know that uh, the firm to provide service to the government. Okay. Oops, the other way, yeah. The government will provide service to the firms. Okay, and the firm to pay tax, taxes this way. And then the other one is the same, the household will pay tax to the government, to your IRS. And then the government will, in turn, give the uh, transfer payment to the household. And again, earlier I mentioned the term transfer payment. So this is like welfare, okay, like, uh, something that the government uh, subsidies that flow the money flow from the government to the household or to anybody who's eligible out there it could be for unemployment or it could be for uh, Medicare it could be for Medicaid or it could be for um, let's see what's another good example welfare for example okay so without expecting any services in return so the government gives out subsidies to the household. For example, government subsidize for house uh, health care. They subsidize for public education. You know, education in the public school. Uh, okay. So next, we say that in the goods and services market, we would have uh, goods and services will flow this way to the household. Okay and. And then the household will pay. Okay, payment will come this way. So, you know, like if you go to Walmart and buy stuff, right, the, you buy 10 CDs. So, this is where 10 CD will get to your pocket. You bring it home, take it home. But then you have to pay. Okay, so right here will be, again, uh, the firms are the one, this is like your Walmart, will produce goods and services. So we go this direction, this is your goods and services, and then of course payment of goods and services to go this way. Because eventually you go to this market, and then uh, however you spend on 10 CD, you go to Walmart that way. So this is a payment in dollar value. Okay, so so far so good there. And then in the case of factor market up here, we say that there are things like, uh, uh, the household will provide labor, okay, because uh, everybody has a job here. Uh, so if you work in the labor market, you know, that's kind of like a factor market. One example is a labor market, okay. Now you can also think in terms of uh, in the financial market, where you put your money in the bank, so is that savings, okay. And then pretty much uh, this would come all the way to the firm because you render your service, you work in a firm, you know, so your labor goes to the firm and your savings go towards it. So the other way would be the firms will have to pay you, your boss will have to pay you uh, wages or payment, yeah. Rent, wages will go this way and then it goes back and come back this way to the factor market. So, um, and that's not the end. So there are other things that are involved here, for example, we haven't talked about this middle part here. So what happened here is, uh, again, uh, the fact, uh, let's start from the beginning here, goods and, so the factor market will provide basically uh, your labor and savings again. Right, because some of you might work for the government. So yeah, you work for the go government or labor and your savings will flow this way. And then there's your mostly services because government produce goods too, you know. Um, for 
example, you know, if you think in terms of public education, so that would be in the form of education and health care, uh, and your goods and services will go this direction here. Okay? So we have to pay government. This is not in, in the form of tax, but payment for the goods and services market. Okay, so like if you go to the U.S. Post Office, you know, you buy stamps, so that goes this way. Okay, and then uh, of course the government would have to pay the factor market. We'd have to pay the U.S. Post Office uh, postal workers' rate, uh, the wages, excuse me. Uh, here it is. So then that's not the end of it. We're almost towards the end now. And then we have another market that I would want to introduce at the end on the site here is use the box here we call this a foreign exchange services. Well this is like trading with other, you know, countries outside the US, like the with Mexico or the Canada or other countries. So then uh, in this case like any company that ship anything overseas the money will flow this direction and then this direction, so both way. And then of course, uh, and you have exports and imports. And so in the goods and services market, exports mean it gets out from the country. Cowboy boots, cowboy hats, Microsoft products. And then what comes in is your imports of textiles, clothing from China, for example. So. And then this is the rest of the world. We call ROW. Stands for the rest of the world, like China, India, um, European unions, and so on. Okay. And then there's this other things like, you know, so we want ways to get out from the system, and we want resources to come in. And that's a big picture. And then right here, we want ways to get out. What do we want? We want natural beauty to come in here. So that gives you a pretty good uh, overall picture of what exactly is a uh, circular flow market of modern. And basically, it's a summary of you know, the three agents, the three round one. How do they interact with each other to three types of markets, factor market, goods and services market, and finally the smaller one is your foreign exchange market. Um, okay, so next it's a quick introduction of uh, a few other terms and then, you know, before I end this chapter. So, now some of you are, like I said earlier, economics is making decisions. Now, you know, we're bombarded with decision-making every day. For example, like at the end of this, watching this video, or, or before you might even click on it and to watch this video, you ask yourself, you know, so is it worth it to watch a video? Would it help me to understand better? I hope the answer is yes. So, and then you might say, well, is it worth it? And, and when you're thinking that way, you're really thinking like an economist. Because a lot of time you could quantify that. We ask questions like, for example, your marginal benefit versus your marginal cost. So we use MC to represent marginal cost, and we use MB to represent marginal benefit. And a lot of time, right, and what exactly is marginal benefit? This is an increase in the benefit that results from an action. So it's slowly increasing. Uh, the marginal cost is an increase in the cost that result from an action. So again, you know, the key term is not like the cost, but it's an increase in cost. So the same thing, or the, the increment, I should say. So marginal benefit is the same, you know, as you produce more and more units, what is that additional benefit I get out from it? Uh, and this is the same thing, you know, as you spend more and more time, what is that additional cost that I get from that particular activity consumed during that period of time, during that additional period of time. 
So we say that a lot of time, if this is greater than your marginal benefit is greater than marginal cost, then you say the conclusion is go ahead. Go ahead means yes, go ahead and do it. You know, go ahead and watch the video. But if it is the other way, you feel that, oh, your marginal cost is actually higher than marginal benefit because today is a bad day, you know, like, uh, there's so many things going on, you just simply don't have time to watch a video, uh, or you might think it's not worth it, you know, just go ahead and take the test, you know, the job, the quizzes, and then go on and do the test, you know, and it might not do so well. If you don't read the book, or at least watch the video, because I hope I could add value to your studying experience here. Uh, in your learning experience. But if it's the other way, you say, oh, don't do it. You know, stay away from this activity. So basically, uh, what is net benefit? Net benefit is you take the marginal benefit minus the marginal cost. So the same thing. So if this turns out to be positive, you say, yes, go ahead and do it. But it turns out to be negative, you say, don't do it. So what that basically is saying is we all think like economists a lot of time. You know, how many of us usually when you come to a conclusion, you say, oh, it's really not worth it. And when you're saying that, you know, you're actually practicing thinking like an economist. What you're saying is, oh, the marginal cost of doing or carrying out this activity is greater than the marginal benefit of doing so. So therefore, I won't do it. See, you're thinking like an economist, won't be. Okay, the last thing that I would talk about here is uh, the two types of analysis. One is called positive analysis versus no normative analysis. You know, in economics, you get both kinds. So what exactly is a positive analysis and what exactly is normative analysis? Uh, according to your book's uh, definition, positive analysis is a form of analysis that try to understand the way things are and why they are that way. So it's a little bit more concrete. For example, you might say uh, the rising of the income tax last year caused people to spend X amount of money this year. Or the other way, excuse me. Uh, let's restate that statement. So, um, last year the income tax has gone up by 20%. So as a result of that, this year people spend 30% less. So you know, you got some number there and it's very sure because you got some number to prove it. That's your positive analysis. You usually state the fact, F-A-C-T. You got some number to prove it. And this will be the opposite. Well, I mean, this is more like subjective. This is more like objective observation because your observation here is based on numbers, some facts that you could back you up. But over here is more like subjective. So one example of this normative analysis would be you say, oh, that was no good. You know, if you raise the tax by uh, 20% last year, uh, the government should not raise the tax so high, you know, so that we spend, uh, that we can spend as much this year. So anytime that you use a word like should not, should, you're introducing some sort of subjective or judgment there. So, yeah, uh, in economics, that's something that we, a lot of time we use that to explain things. And, and you know, for the most part, econo economists like to deal with this, that to some extent, you know, certain policy making, you have to use terms like that, like should or should not, you know, to introduce a policy. But that's sort of like a sign, this is more like an argument or an art, if you might call it. Oh, those signs, if you practice it long enough, you know, it becomes like an art, you know. You heard people say, like, what's your hunch, you know, what, where the economy is going next. 
Okay, a lot of definitions of words are involved here. So the other, th the last word that I'll introduce before we close for today is the word incentive. So what does the word incentive means to you? Do you have incentive to do well in this class? So what did I say? Do you have incentive to do well in this class? And I hope all of you say yes. What's an incentive? Incentive is you want to get an A, right? You want to make a good grade, you know? Uh, yeah, incentive, uh, so then a lot of time instructor throw out, you know, bonus points, and then you want to go ahead and try to get those points as much as you could. But you know, even without these bonus points, then typically, you know, you would want to have incentive to want to do well. So you sign up for this course, course and you pay for it to some extent. Okay, I think the rest I won't go over it as much because uh, there are two examples in the last two slides here. And it basically talks about what we already talked about, you know, the increasing opportunity cost and the constant opportunity cost. So, and again, the difference between the two is uh, in the case of constant opportunity cost, you have a straight line. Uh, production possibly the frontier is a straight line. So everything is the same, you know, it's one for one, you know, your trade-off is one soda for one uh, pizza. But then in the case of increasing opportunity cost, the more pizza that you gain, you have to give up more and more units of soda. Uh, that's called increasing opportunity cost. Let's just review a summary of what we talked about that's sort of important. So, uh, so we're done for the first lecture in chapter one. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy uh, this course. We'll have more videos coming up. Thank you.